wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the land. Hi, my name is Darren Johnson. Welcome to our show. Now today, we'll be teaching on the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, 22-25 says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Verse 24, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Since the time of Moses, Exodus chapter 3 and thereafter, the people of Israel were shown signs by God to authenticate that God was behind it. This continued in the New Testament until the Word of God was finished, 1 Corinthians 13.10. Remember that the sign that someone was an apostle was that he could perform signs and wonders or miraculous events, 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, to show that he was sent by God. So the Jew required signs by God whereas the Greeks in the first century sought after wisdom or intellectual explanations of things and how knowledge is applied in all things to this life. However, Paul's main message is Christ crucified for salvation, which is a stumbling block to the Jews who reject him as their Messiah, and foolishness to the Greeks because it doesn't make any intellectual sense. However, to the person who gets saved, Christ crucified is a source of power and wisdom from God. Remember when a person gets saved, they go from being under the law or the penalty of sin to being under grace or have the power of God through the Holy Spirit to sin no more. Through direct communication with God through the Holy Spirit, a saved person can get God's wisdom for this life in everything. Hence the foolishness of God or Christ crucified is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26-27 it says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 27, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. As a result of the way God set it up, not many who trust in the wisdom of man you know, the educated or intellectually smart, the physically strong, nor noble, or high up in the civil authority ranks, so on and so forth, they don't get saved or get called in God's foreknowledge. Most of them don't. Why? They're trusting in the things of this life that they have a great advantage in. Look at Jeremiah 9.23. Hence, God uses the foolish things of the world, the not educated, the not physically strong, not high up in civil authority or social standing, so on and so forth, to confound the wise, as well as the weak things, to confound or confuse the things which are mighty. You know, before I got saved, I was very strong and very smart. I got saved, and I started having health issues almost immediately. I found that slowly over time, my health became more restricted, and I had to find ways to serve the Lord that the normal healthy person took for granted. In terms of wisdom, I was very good in math, but I was poor in English, and I was poor with interacting with people. So what did God do? He called me to preach, and I had to literally preach to hundreds of thousands of people. Maybe take the television ministry, literally millions. And when I traveled as an evangelist to preach at the fairs, festivals, and flea markets, guess what? I had to talk to people. <laughs> I had to be really good with people. I got to the point where people were just so impressed with my abilities. And I was like, boy, if they only knew who I really was, and that God did it all. Moreover, God gave me an internet ministry where I write books, teachings, and sermons without anyone's help that are being downloaded by the truckload every month. I wasn't good at English, wasn't good at writing, wasn't good at organizing my thoughts. So what did God do? Did he use my strengths? No. He used my weaknesses. They confounded me, and he confounded everybody but the word of God was preached and God was glorified greatly. And to top all this off, I did it without a church salary. And I worked full time to support myself while everyone was opposing me. 
I also did all the editing as well as figure out the software to make it happen, which was another weakness of mine. Wasn't good with software and video. That said, I believe by faith with God's power, I can, through my weaknesses, do almost anything with almost nothing to reach effectively the multitudes and individuals for God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 28-31 it says, And base things of the world, and things which are despised, has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29, That no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Verse 31, That according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Base means the bottom, and despised means hated. For example, copper is a base metal. Currently, at the time of this videoing, it traded for about 20 cents an ounce, or about $3.20 a pound. Whereas gold was trading at $1,673 an ounce. So God uses the simple and hated things of the world to bring to naught or nothing the things that are held in high esteem and are valuable. For example, Believing Jesus for salvation and going to heaven when you die is simple. Whereas trying to be good in the future, evolving over several so-called lives or reincarnation to get to heaven, that's complicated. Now my friend, understand one thing. The things of God are simple. The things of Christ are simple. The things of the devil are complicated. When the complicated becomes simple, that's God. When the simple becomes complicated, that's the devil. Okay. Remember that spiritual rule. At the end of the day, God set it up so that no one for any reason could brag on his good works. Look at Isaiah 64, 6. Or his abilities meriting him salvation in heaven. Look at Titus 3, 5. It says, not by works of righteousness which we had done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Not by works. Past works, present works, future works, or the combination thereof. That's why salvation is by grace or through God's unmerited favor. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Now for the saved person, he is part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Christ is the Christian source of wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Look at John 15, 1 through 7. Therefore, a Christian should only glory in the Lord and what God has done. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 3 it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring out to you the testimony of God, Verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. Verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Verse 5, That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. When the Apostle Paul came to Corinth preaching the gospel, he didn't use excellency of speech, like a politician or orator. He declared a testimony of God or Christ crucified with weakness, fear, and much trembling. All he cared about was that the Corinthians got the truth of God for salvation and then lived godly. Paul didn't use man's wisdom to entice. He didn't try to attract or tempt by offering pleasure or advantage. He didn't entice people into believing something. He didn't use gimmicks or gadgets, but he used a demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. That was done so that the faith of the saved Corinthians would stand on the power of God through his word and not on the wisdom of man. You know, today in America, we have churches that use gimmicks, you know, free giveaways, especially to kids, like free food, candy, merchandise through drawings, so on and so forth, and they use gadgets to get people to come to church, such as church contests, to see who can get the most results in six weeks, so on and so forth. They'll also use gimmicks to get people to pray a prayer of salvation and get baptized and attend church. Now, Christian, salvation is serious. They've got to repent. They've got to believe by faith. They've got to understand. If they don't, you know, they're just praying into the wind. God won't save them. They need to understand what baptism is and why they're doing it. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. You know, lost people attend church. Religious people attend church. If they don't know why they're attending, if they don't know what it's about, it's not going to do them any good. We need to get back to the power of God and the Word of God. 
for getting people saved and getting them right with God. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. We've got to stop trusting in multi-million dollar facilities and programs and gimmicks and gadgets and singles groups. We need to trust in the power of God, in the word of God, in the faith of God, for the true results of God. Until that happens, you're just wasting your time. This country's going to hell at the speed of light, and you're not making any difference. You're part of the problem. Oh, anyways, so the churches of today use image. It looks good. Or politics. It sounds good. Or emotion. They want to hype you up to do something. Or coercion. Create an environment to force you to do things. You know, the constant ultimatum. They try to make you look bad. They play down what they don't want, and they play up what they do want. Even if you're acting holy, and they're acting unholy. That's what religion does. They have a religious agenda. They don't care whether it's right or wrong, they're going to do it. That's not the Bible. Christian, you should say, if God says it, I need to do it. If I don't understand it, tell God the truth. I'm an idiot, I don't understand it. Could you explain it to me? If you're not sure, be safe. Don't. Wait till you find out what it means or whether or not you should do something. Then do it by faith. Don't rush blindly into things. And leaders, talk to your congregation. Be honest with them. Let them ask questions. Let them question. Let them cast doubt on you. Let them challenge you. And you guys work it out. And work through your faith, through fear and trembling. That way the leadership grows and the congregation grows. And then you have a congregation that can train the next generation in their church, as well as reach out in the community and train others. As well as seeing the multitude saved and get the word of God out. Rather than what we have in America today, where it seems like the homosexual movement has more power than the churches do. And other such nonsense. How pathetic. Anyways, I have also seen churches manipulate the situation to get people to work for the church in the name of serving the Lord and surrender for the ministry. That shouldn't be the case. It's not about how you manipulate the situation, how you play the politics. Let God lead. Let God manipulate. Let God work things out. And I've also seen people, when they realize what's going on that are holy, they leave those churches. Because man's in control, not God. Man will use the Bible to push his religious agenda to control the people convince them that if they leave their brain at the door, everything will be fine. Sound familiar? Sound like your church? Looking for a real one? Come visit mine. So the problem here is that people are serving the Lord for the wrong reasons, and people are coming to church for the wrong reasons, and people are going to church for the wrong reasons. As a result, carnality takes over the leadership, and the congregation becomes either carnal as well as a lot of lost people joining the church who think they're saved. Meanwhile, those living godly and teaching and preaching godliness against the will of the religious and carnal leadership are found offenders and either compromise their standards or leave the church altogether. For example, I used to attend a church where a person there, he won a contest for an all-expense-paid trip for the results he had in the promotion. But that person was as carnal as can be. And later, he went on to live openly with an unmarried girl, without shame, and all the church knew about him. But for that six weeks, he was a spiritual man. No, he wasn't. He was just the religious man. His heart was in the world. Before and after that contest, his spirituality was rarely seen. Later on, a few years later, the guy actually got saved. And what's my point here? You know, the flesh can win a contest. The flesh can get hyped up in religion. The flesh can obey our religious rules, but the flesh doesn't get saved. The flesh is not holy. You've got to get saved, you've got to get the Spirit of God in you, and God's got to do it through you. Otherwise, it doesn't count. It's like ironing your clothes without plugging the ironing. You're doing all the right motions for a period of time, but the power is not on. You're not plugged into God. And you see, if you want to re renew yourself every day, Christian, you've got to do it in the power of God. You do it in the flesh, it's not going to do you any good. So like that person there, he did it in the flesh, but until God dealt with him in the word of God, in the power of God, like Paul preached, nothing spiritually happened. You know, sadly to say, the church grows numerically, but it doesn't grow spiritually. And to accommodate for the carnality and the worldliness, 
the church has to compromise to keep the number, as well as the offerings and the prestige that goes with it. Meanwhile, the holy people get run off or marginalized or they compromise the state. And that's America for you. Churches on every corner, no power of God. So, after a person is saved, his only motivation for doing right should be future rewards. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. Also, he should fear the punishment for sinning. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. Or the blessings in this life from God. Mark 10, 29 to 30. Which, by the way, includes persecutions. Okay? 2 Timothy 3, 12. And to fellowship with God. John 14, 21, 23. You know, if you're going to be fellowshipping with God forever, Christian, why don't you start now? Practice now. Practice now having a full relationship with God and being sold out to God and loving God and just throwing away everything the world has to offer and selling out to everything that God has to offer. That's what you're going to be doing for forever. Start now. In my New Testament church, if the scriptures of God don't motivate a person to be spiritual, I'll just pray for that person and let God take it from there. The New Testament church is not to be like a concert, carnival, or sporting event. Look at 1 John 2, 15 through 17. But a training center to live godly, Titus 2, 12. You know, that's the Christian's first love, godliness. And to evangelize the world, Mark 16, 15. That's the Christian's first work. And if your church isn't doing the first work of evangelism and the first love of holiness, how can anything else be right? And that's why a lot of churches out there don't even have a word of God in their building. And if they did, they don't even believe it's perfect. And the only perfect Bible in English is the Old King James Authorized Version. If you don't, if you don't have one, get your copy. Go to my website there. And you want the original perfect manuscript? Go to my website there. Got a copy of that one too. Something you put in your hand and say, this is God's word. This is God's final authority in all of life. Psalms 138, verse 2. And when you do that, you'll get a hold of God and find out God's will for your life. 1 Corinthians 2, 6-8 says, How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world, that come to naught. Verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 8, Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul spoke the wisdom of God. Proverbs 1.7, Proverbs 9.10, amongst those that were perfect, or evidently those in the world who think they are. He didn't speak the wisdom of the world, you know, like the college professors, the evolutionists, the psychologists, the philosophers, you know, the princes or leaders of the world, you know, like the American Congress or Supreme Court, the socialist and communist governments, so on and so forth. Paul spoke the wisdom of God in a mystery, 1 Timothy 3.16. You know, God was manifest in the flesh. His name is Jesus. Jesus was God, manifest in the flesh, Muslims, John 1.14, and dwelt among us. He is the Savior. He is God, not Allah. You trust in Allah, you're going straight to hell. You need to trust in Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, but by me, John 14.6. Time to wake up and smell the coffee. Jesus died for mankind's sin, John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He can take away your sin, Muslim, and save you. If you want more information on salvation, wait to the end of the show. I've got a seven-minute presentation. Jesus rose from the dead and then went back up to heaven, Acts 1, 8 through 11. Before the crucifixion, it was a mystery or hidden wisdom on how God would make this happen. Yet to be saved, you have to believe it by faith. And everyone in the Bible got saved the same way. Look at Acts 10, 43-48. They put their faith in Jesus. So God planned or ordained it to be this way so that the saved person would have God's glory in this life and the life to come. That said, if the leaders of the world would have understood God's perfect word, Psalms 19, 7, they would not have wrongfully turned over Jesus to be crucified. You know, to Pilate, Herod, the Roman authority of the day. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-10 says, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10, But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
In the life to come, man hasn't seen, heard, or even thought about the things which God will do for him in the future. However, to the saved person, God has revealed some of those things that he will do through the Spirit of God. You know, the millennium, eternity, Revelations 20 through 22. And if you want more information on that, download my book on the book of Revelation. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 13 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The spirit of man is what connects the mind or soul to the flesh when carrying out an operation. Hence, the spirit of man knows the things of man or his thoughts and actions. Likewise, the spirit of God knows the things of God or his thoughts and actions. When a lost person gets saved, he gets the Holy Spirit put in him. Ephesians 1.13 Now the saved person can know the things of God and choose them in the power of God when carrying out the operation of God. 1 Peter 1.15-16 1, As a result, the Christian can testify or speak in the power of God. Matthew 10.20 What God requires and teaches. He can also compare spiritual with spiritual as well as scripture with scripture. 2 Peter 1.20 To put the spiritual pieces together, to figure out what God requires for him in this life in every aspect. Technically speaking, a spirit is your ghost inside your body. A ghost is when your spirit leaves your body like a death. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit inside our body. However, he is outside of God's body or the body of Jesus while in the believer's body, as well as always free roaming, and hence he is called the Holy Ghost. 1 John 5, 7. 1 Corinthians 2, 14-16 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The natural or lost person doesn't have the Spirit of God within him. Hence, until he gets saved, Romans 10, 13, he can't receive the things of the Spirit of God, nor know them. As a result, the things of God are foolishness to him, because they are spiritually discerned through the Spirit of God, and not the Spirit of man. For example, this is why before you get saved, the teachings of the Bible are spiritually dead, and seem foolish or stupid, as well as contradictory. After you get saved, get spiritual, and get a hold of God, the teachings of God are simple to understand. They're wise, and they're so right on the money, <laughs> it's scary. You know, for example, you see what's going on in America today and in Europe? Read the Old Testament. Read my verse-by-verse -verse commentary. It's like history is repeating itself, right on the money in America. It's so true, it's scary. And if the Christians would have known the Old Testament like they're supposed to, they'd be crying out in the streets and preaching everywhere, warning people. Instead, the Old Testament is a dead book to them. And they're like, well, I guess this is just what's supposed to happen. Stupid Christian, wake up. And if you need some help, read my uh, books on the Old Testament, verse by verse commentary. And if you need a church to explain it to you, come visit mine. It's free in your price range. Okay, I'm just trying to help you. So when you are spiritual or saved, and not carnal, you can get a hold of God and understand any spiritual truth as well as make correct spiritual judgments of all things in this life. John 7, 24. When you make correct spiritual judgments of God, now man can judge you and say that you are wrong. You know, John 7, 24 says, judge righteous judgment. Christian, you can make correct spiritual judgments when you're spiritual and you get a hold of God. God just doesn't want you to judge hypocritically, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. So once you're spiritual, you can judge and say what's right, what's wrong, how to get the wrong right, how to keep the right right. And you judge according to God's word, not your own. So the Christian, through assessing the Spirit of God within him, can know the mind of the Lord in every situation. Man can instruct God, only God can instruct man. Remember, 
that the Bible is all about judging things correctly in this life. In civil government, they have laws, statutes, a police force, army, circuit courts, supreme court, so on and so forth, to judge and to enforce judgments. So don't give me the baloney, oh, love, don't judge. That's what liberals say, okay? Don't fall for that, Christian. The world is full of continual judgments. They need to be spiritual judgments. You judge every day. Just don't judge hypocritically, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, like the liberals always do, like the Democrat Party always seems to do. They say one thing and do another. I mean, this last election cycle, some of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard have come from the Democrats. Anyways, I digress. Hypocrisy is not righteous judging. You know, like the kind you find with the liberal media, Hollywood, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, so on and so forth. You know, NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN, so on and so forth. This is why it's good to have an old King James Bible, part of everyone's education growing up. You had the perfect book with perfect laws and judgments, John 12, 48. But our genius government kicked the Bible out back in the 60s. And now we have drugs, violence, fornication in its place, along with the crummy education system that gives the average kid six years of training in 12 years. That's what happens when you don't judge righteously and you kick God out. Now, we will continue with our lesson on the book of 1 Corinthians. But now we're going to pause for a commercial. What does the Bible say about gay and lesbian marriages? Well, first of all, all through the Bible, marriage is between a man and a woman. It's never between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. You know, the Bible says in Leviticus 18, 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Hey, even the actual sexual practice was condemned all through the Bible. Now, a lot of people say, hey, look, we don't want religion in the courthouse. But listen, it's not religion that we want out of the courthouse. We want sin out of the courthouse. Hey, we've got enough corruption, okay? Now, in the Bible, just like any other sin, God judges the person who practices it and the nation that condones it. Now, we don't hate the sinner. We hate the sin. Okay? Now look, you've committed the act of sodomy or being gay or lesbian. Look, God can forgive you, but you need to repent of it and do what's right. Now Christians, look, if God doesn't go for the act of being gay or lesbian, he's certainly not going to go for gay or lesbian marriages. We need to unite and stand against gay and lesbian marriages in the state of Louisiana and make a stand for God. Hey, it's God's way. It's the right way. It's the Bible way. What does the Bible say about abortion? Look, abortion is plainly murder. You know, God always recognized a person in the womb. If you look at Genesis 25, verse 23, the Bible said, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. You know, now, if it's a person in the womb, and it's not a fetus, and we kill it, it's plainly murder. And you know in the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. Now look, a lot of people say, look, I'm tired of people putting their morals on me, you know, in society. But look, we don't want to get religion out of our morals in society. We want to get sin and unrighteousness out of our morals in society. The Bible says that sin is a reproach to any people. Now, we don't hate the sinner. We hate the sin. Look, you've committed abortion. Look, God can forgive you. He loves you. He still wants to save you. You can still serve him, but you just got to put it behind you and just do what's right. Okay? Now, Christians, look, abortion is murder. Now, Christians, we need to unite in the state of Louisiana against abortion. You know why? It's God's way. It's the right way. It's the Bible way. All right, continuing with our lesson on the book of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Verse 2, I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Verse 3, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? 
For a saved person, he is either carnal or spiritual. Now, a carnal person is someone who is saved, but his life is characterized by unholy or worldly living. Look at 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Or he's spiritually and he's saved, and his life is characterized by holy or godly living. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. The Christians at Corinth, or the Corinthians, were carnal in their behavior and were acting like babies in Christ, 1 Peter 2, 2, and not mature Christians, Hebrews 5, 13 through 14. Paul noticed that they weren't growing spiritually and still couldn't handle the spiritual milk of the word that he was providing them through teaching and preaching. This was noted by the envying, a feeling of discontent or covetousness with regard to another's advantages. Strife, heated, often violent dissension, bitter conflict, and divisions, a difference of opinion, disagreement in the New Testament church at Corinth. A spiritual church will be unified around the commandments of God, John 14, 15, and not some religious views, Mark 7, 5 through 9. There won't be any bitter conflicts because everyone will want holiness to rule, or cooler heads with Jesus always prevail. When your doctrine is correct and you are empowered by the Spirit to serve, division disappears. Sadly like to say in America, carnality usually rules the churches. In the name of more attendance, offerings, and prestige, spirituality is sacrificed and or compromised. Sound like your church, Christian? You tired of it? Looking for a real church? Come to mine. We don't have that problem. As a result, your church is full of carnal Christians, assuming they're not lost, that act like the world and care only about worldly things, such as the world's entertainment, finances, personal relationships in the flesh. Now, I understand that personal relationships and finances are important in life, but they're not the main thing, Christian. Godly living, preaching the gospel, those are the first love and first work. That's the main thing. You take care of God's first love and first work, the rest takes care of itself. Getting the right personal relationships, getting your finances in order. Then God's involved, and he takes care of it for you. Matthew 6.33, for his glory and his power. Now, for more information on how to live godly, download my teaching on separation, part one and two, and the book of First John on the, off the website there. Now, for example, this is why almost all of your Southern Baptist and non-denominational churches in America are a powerless spiritual joke to the Bible believer. They look good, they sound good, they've got gimmicks, they've got gadgets, they've got programs, but for the most part, they're spiritually dead. Watered-down milk is all they got. But for the Bible believer, it's built on evangelism, which is the first work of the Christian, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And holiness, the first love of the Christian, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, are the main things of the New Testament church of which every other physical need will follow, Matthew 6, 33. You know, when I traveled as an evangelist, evangelism was usually reduced to knocking doors one hour a week with a week's salvation presentation and holiness was reduced to conforming to the pastor's and leadership's religious wishes and agenda. When I started teaching and preaching about spiritual things, that upset the church apple cart in my travels, and I was quickly dismissed. You know, in the old days, the evangelists told the truth and focused on the things that people were doing wrong and needed to change. Now the successful evangelist seems to be the ones that are puppets or controlled by the pastor of that particular church. You know, anything to justify to keep a paycheck in the name of spirituality. Boy, times have changed, haven't they? And look at our country. The Bible says, The wicked shall be turned into hell in all nations that forget God. Psalms 9.17 Our churches have forgotten the ways of God. Our people have forgotten the ways of God. And our country is going to hell faster than the speed of light. A baby is weak in the flesh and totally dependent on his mother or babysitter to, pro to provide his every need. Babies usually eat, cry, wet their bed, they're held in your arms, and they sleep. Until they grow and mature, they're pretty useless to society in terms of the workforce at home or away. Babies need milk to help them grow. Over time, they can start eating some more solid food. Within their first two years, they learn how to walk and talk. And at age five, their brain has fully developed physically. And at age six, you start first grade and have some basic knowledge with applications. Spiritually, a babe in Christ is the same way. 
he is almost spiritually useless to the work of the New Testament church, and that he's totally dependent spiritually on everything when it comes to teaching and preaching. Like a baby, you need to feed him a little at a time in spiritual foods. And that's easy to swallow. Over time, you give him more solid spiritual food until he grows up enough spiritually to handle basic tasks independently. As time proceeds, a day will come when he can prepare and teach a Bible study on basic doctrines, and then later more complicated doctrines. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6 says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Verse 5, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. Verse 6, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. In Corinth, they had saved people in the church following personalities, or what a person said is equal to or over what God said. This is a form of man idol worship. Look at 1 John 5.21. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.12. Where the Christian leader becomes a Christian celebrity, and you follow him regardless of what the Bible says. People who exalt and follow Christian personalities, you know, like your average independent Baptist, they're carnal. Paul and Apollos are preachers of the truth sent by God. God sends the preachers who plant the seed of truth as well as water the seed of truth. However, God makes the seed sprout at salvation and grow at consecration. Mature Christian leaders aren't worried about the preeminence, look at 3 John verse 9, but about doing God's will in God's power regardless who gets the praise and credit. Beware of preachers who are always promoting their church or ministry over just doing right. You know, I remember one person from a big Baptist Bible school who claimed that their Bible school was first place and mine was second place, rather than promote the propagation of Bible schools with the learning thereof. A teacher said that no one ever did anything that went to a Bible correspondence school like I did. It's sad how their church and school was full of corruption, carnality, and Phariseeism. Not to mention that they made national news because their pastor had sex with a minor. Oh, brother. Beware when your preacher says, it's not what was said, but who said it. No, my friend, it's not who said it, but what was said, and if it matches the Bible or not. That's what's important. Now, a person who does that, he's promoting a person or personality equal to or over the Word of God. That's dangerous. I have experienced this as an evangelist, and here are some of the replies I got when I responded to some issue by saying, but the Bible says otherwise on any particular issue. They say things like, well, the pastor's always right. No, my friend, the Bible's always right. Even God's under his word, Psalms 138, verse 2. Another response, I would never go against the teachings of Dr. So-and-so. You know, I could put several names in the blank there. It doesn't matter what Dr. So-and-so says if Dr. Jesus says otherwise according to his word. Amen? There are many Dr. So-and-sos who violate the user's manual. You know, the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. Here's another one. I don't care whether he's right or wrong, I'm going to do what he says. Okay, fine. Leave your brain at the door. Be like the liberals, okay? Be like the Democrats. Don't think, just follow. Help destroy the country. What a stupid idea, man. Christian, God taught you to muse, to think on his word, which is the opposite of amuse, or not to think. You know, if the pastor's wrong, he's wrong, according to God's word. Do what God says. You have personal accountability. Yes, you're under authority, and you have to submit to authority, but you don't have to submit to sin. That's where personal accountability and authority separate. Look at my teaching on proper authority off the website there. <laughs> and learn the Bible. And finally, here's one. The pastor says, I am okay, so therefore, I am okay. Well, if you're not okay, according to the Word of God, you're not okay, regardless of what your pastor says. A lot of pastors out there that have been caught with pornography, adultery, fornication, stealing, and they say you're okay. If God doesn't say you're okay, if the Bible doesn't say you're okay, you're not okay, Christian. That's the standard of living. Psalm 138, verse 2. Psalm 19, 7. Psalm 12, 6, and 7. And that's the old King James Bible for the English-speaking people. Go on my website and download you one.
stop making excuses in your life and saying things like, oh, well, it's, it's the system. I'll work with the system until the system, oh, just shut up. Stop making excuses for your sin. Go with God's system, the Bible. If they don't want to go with it, then leave them behind. If you're looking for a real church, come to mine. So I like to say in some of these churches, pastors were later caught stealing and or fornicating. Also, these churches are spiritually dwarfed by the usual line of baloney of politically controlled manipulation of the facts and the justice thereof, while proclaimed to be the best of the best. You've never been loved, you've been loved by us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so on and so forth. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 through 9 says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Paul makes it clear that God is the one that saves a person and helps him grow spiritually through the scriptures. The preacher is just a vessel that God chooses to use. Look at 1 Timothy 1, 19-21. That's why in my church, I'm a team leader. I mean, someone's got to be in charge. Someone's got to prepare the lessons. Someone's got to give guidance. But people don't leave their brains at the door. We encourage them to bring them in. We encourage them to ask questions. We encourage them to go home and look it up and study and get a hold of God and find out God's will for their life. We teach them how to get it independently. We teach them how to train others to get it independently. That's what the training center of the church is. And I just pray for people and give them the word of God and let God deal with them. And it always works out. So a Christian shouldn't praise the vessel or a person that God uses, but glorify God for what that person has done. Remember that at the judgment seat of Christ, God will reward fully the one that waters and plants in the ministry of God. Christians labor together as a team to build up God's body of believers, 1 Corinthians 12, God's building, 1 Peter 2, 5, and God's husbandry, or the care of a household, or God's house, which is a New Testament church where the believers meet in the power of God. Or at least they're supposed to meet in the power of God, otherwise God isn't visiting them, and they're wasting their time. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11 says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul is God's master builder in making the building of God, which is a New Testament church on earth. The foundation of the building is a concrete slab that the rest of the building is built on. Spiritually, Paul laid the foundation of Jesus Christ who is the only source of salvation, John 14, 6. And the foundation of consecration is Jesus Christ, John 14, 15, John 15, 1 through 7. You know, as a missionary, Paul started New Testament churches where before there were no churches. Behind him were people trained and ordained to take his place in running these New Testament churches after he was gone. Hence, others built on his foundation. Now, Paul also warned on being careful how you build on that foundation. In construction, if you don't build on the foundation properly, you have problems with certain parts of your building later on. And spiritually, it's the same way. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 14, If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. The spiritual foundation for any Christian is salvation or Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He is saved to do good works. Ephesians 2, 10. Which builds upon this foundation. The works in the life of a Christian will either be of God, or gold, silver, and precious stones, of things of great value, or, a or of the flesh, wood, hay, stubble, stuff that won't pass the fire, that burns up in the fire, or no value. At the judgment seat of Christ, 
Jesus will take your life's works, since you got saved, and set it on fire. Only the things you did for God will pass through the holy fire, just like at a refinery. At a refinery, you can send it platinum, palladium, silver, gold, and they set it to a certain temperature in the fire, and everything will burn up, except for those precious metals. And that's what you get paid for, a certain percentage of the spot price. And that's like your spiritual works, Christian. Anything you've done in this life, that will get rewarded. And oh, by the way, at these refineries, they also have precious stone removal. So that way, everything of value is kept, and everything else is burnt up. That's not valuable. So the reward of the Christian that God will give him is what passes through the spiritual fire of God. Not just a crown that's put on your head. Okay. Notice that if everything a Christian did after salvation burns up, he is still saved. He just saved, yet so is by fire. See, your future works don't keep you saved or get you saved. They get you rewards. That's why, Christian, we serve God. Because it's the best way to live, and we get rewarded. And that's how we're going to live forever anyway. You might as well just start practicing now and, and enjoy it and be blessed in this life and the life to come, regardless of your worldly circumstances. Now, salvation is God's work, and it is eternal. John 10, 28, 29. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelt in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. A Christian is a temple of God because he has a Spirit of God in him, as a result of salvation. Ephesians 1, 13. Remember that the temple in Jerusalem was God's house, and where God met with the nation of Israel on the spiritual level. The Christian is to take care of his body physically and spiritually like it is God's temple. He shouldn't defile it with fornication, smoking, drinking alcohol for non-medical purposes, street drugs, adultery along with the iniquity of grievous sins in general. God's temple is holy. Whether the temple in Jerusalem under Mosaic law or the Christian's body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Hence, it should be treated as holy in every aspect of life, in thought, in action. You know, God promises to destroy the Christian's body if he defiles his body with sin. The degree you defile it is directly related to the degree he will destroy it, James 1, 14-15. I hope that teaching was a blessing to you. However, if you are lost and not saved, when you die, you will go to hell and then the lake of fire. But if you'd like to escape hell and the lake of fire, I'm going to take some time right now and show you how you can be 100% sure when you die, you can go to heaven. I'm going to show you how to go to heaven. Now, the first thing on how to go to heaven is knowing that you're a sinner. Now, we'll start with this picture right here. Now, sin makes you dirty on the inside. You know, the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. You ever made a dirty thought, made a wicked thought, made you feel dirty on the inside? Well, that's what sin will do. Sin is when you break God's law. You ever disobey your parents? Well, the Bible says, uh, honor thy father and thy mother. So kids, you ever do what's wrong? Well, hey, that's a sin. You ever uh, steal before? The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Anyway, sin is when you break God's law, and it'll make you guilty on the inside. Hey, we've all sinned. Okay? I sin, you sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Once you recognize you're a sinner, then you need to recognize God has to punish sin. Now, why do parents punish their kids? For being bad, right? Well, why would God punish you? Same reason. Now, you notice there's two places where a person can go. Either the heaven or the lake of fire. Okay? Now, why would a person go to the lake of fire? Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Okay? God has to be just and punish our sins, just like you have to punish your kids when they're bad. But the Bible says, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God provides a way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Now, what did Jesus do on the cross? He died for our sins. Now, the Bible says that in 1 John 5, 20, it says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true 
even in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. So Jesus, he's the son of God, he's God, and he's eternal life. So we have to go to God, the one who died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead three days later for our sins, for forgiveness. Now, another thing you need to do is you need to repent. You need to turn to God from your sins. Bible says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, these people right here, who do you think God could forgive? Well, they've got a change of heart. He doesn't have a change of heart. That's what repentance is. It's, turn, it's a change of heart towards God. Your want to changes, okay? Yeah. When you want to change, then God can forgive you. You can't be sorry that you just got caught, okay? You gotta be sorry and want to change, okay? Then once you have a repentant heart, let me show you what to do next. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, that it's the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanses us from all sin, okay? Now, what God wants to do, he wants to forgive all of your sin. He wants to forgive your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin, once for all, by his blood. Now, so once all your sins are forgiven, hey, where would you go? Heaven. Hey, if my past sins and my present sins and my future sins are all gone, I'm going to heaven. And then the Bible says that when we get forgiven, that the Spirit of God comes in. And when we, have spirit, uh, when we have the Spirit of God within us, we know we're saved. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, that in whom, ye also, I'm sorry, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? You know, when you get sealed by God's Spirit, it's like being born into God's family. Now, when you got born, you were born into a bloodline, right? Now, does that ever change? Of course not. Once you're born to a bloodline, it's forever. Well, in the same way, once you're born into God's bloodline, he seals you, it's forever. It's eternal. It will never change. Now notice, it's not by good works. Now don't get me wrong, God wants you to be good, okay? After you're saved, he wants you to go to church. He wants you to get baptized. He wants you to read the Bible. He wants you to pray. He wants you to do what's right. But works will never save you. Hey, were you born into your family's bloodline because you were good? No, you were born that way. Hey, if you do something bad, can you be unborn out of your family's bloodline? No, it never changes. It's eternal. See, the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, okay? The blood washes us clean, the Spirit of God comes in, we are saved forever. Now, if you would like to be forgiven, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray out loud like I want God to forgive me, and if you wanna be forgiven, you just pray along and just ask God to forgive you, okay? Now, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone can do it anywhere. You just got to mean it in your heart, okay? Now, if you're just going to laugh and not be serious, you'll be like this guy. But if you're serious and you want to change and trust his blood only, he can save you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to pray out loud like I want God to forgive me. And I'll say a few words. I'll pause. Then you can pray. Then I'll say a few more words. And then I'll pause. You can pray. And you can ask the Lord to save you, okay? So let's bow our heads. If you want to be saved, Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to the lake of fire, but I want to change. Please forgive me of all my sins. By your blood, once for all, so I can go to heaven. Amen. Now, if you ask God to forgive you, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are saved forever. 
you have eternal life. Okay? If you'd like more information, just go to our website at newlifelafayette.com. That's newlifelafayette.com. You'll find other links to uh, good Christian websites, such as uh, Bible Lessons Online, free tracks in many languages. They have a Bible online, which you can download. You can get information on creation. You can, uh, they have an online church directory. And of course, other free Christian information. I think you get a lot out of it if you check it out. Also, if you're not 100% sure that you're saved and still don't understand how to go to heaven, please go to our section on salvation and how to be sure 100% that you can go to heaven and read it. And then once you understand what it says, just pray the prayer at the end with a repentant heart and faith in the blood of Jesus. And God promises that he will save you. Thank you for watching again. And tune in next time for the Bible Believers Teaching and Preaching Hour. See you next time. Jehovah